Hi, everyone. I'll give you a chance to connect to sound. Hello. Hi, and welcome this Tuesday to the Brooklyn Rails 981st New Social Environment. Grateful to be in this virtual space with you all on this snowy day in New York, the official end to the 701-day snow drought. Um, <laughs> I'm Chloe, Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Glenn Kano and Dan Cameron. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Glenn and Dan. Glenn Kano is known internationally for his expansive vision and activist-minded practice, which encompasses painting, sculpture, installation, performance, monumental public art, theatrical production, and feature film. Focusing on equity, social justice, and climate change, among other urgent topics, the artist's work traces through lines among various art historical movements. A relentless optimist, Kano creates work imbued with hope, revealing structures of power and domination and creating opportunities for direct action and progress, all rooted in the belief that cultural production can affect real change. And our host today, New York-based curator, art writer, and educator, Dan Cameron, launched his career in 1982 with extended sensibilities at the New Museum, the first institutional effort in the U.S. to examine gay and lesbian identity in art. For over 40 years, Cameron has held senior curatorial positions at the New Museum, at Orange County Museum of Art, and CAC New Orleans, and organized more than 100 museum exhibitions. In 2007, Dan founded Prospect New Orleans, the contemporary art triennial to benefit the city after Hurricane Katrina and organize the first two editions. And with that, I am going to pass it over to Dan. Thank you so much, Chloe. Um, and welcome, everyone. It's really, really a pleasure to be here. I'm actually sitting in, in uh, Santiago, Chile, uh, where I, I have to admit that it's uh, in the high 80s. Um, but I can't wait to get back to New York this weekend um, and join you all in the fun. Um, but um, it's really especially a privilege for me. I've, I've done a few, um, you know, be, uh, new social environment uh, conversations over the years. But doing one with Glen Kano is important to me for because it brings back my own experience in Southern California, where for just under five years, uh, starting in 2012, I was based in Southern California. And one of the reasons it was a good time to be in Southern California as a curator dealing with contemporary art is because that's when Glenn Kano's career just started taking off. I mean, I beyond just having been able to visit him in his studio, I saw show after show uh, of, of work that really just amazed me uh, with what how much he was taking on as, in terms of subject matter but also how far he was willing to push the mediums which in, within which he was working. Um, so I just want to say, first of all, congratulations to Glenn on, on, on your new show. It just opened at Pace Gallery, um, and I've heard it's a smash. Um, thank you so much, Dan and Chloe and the whole team um, here. Um, you know, one of the big goals was to be number 981 on the podcast um, Stream. I didn't want to be 980. I wanted to be 981. So, you know, I, I strategically planned this entire show to, to be that. Uh, no, I'm super excited to be here. And and Dan, <laughs> it's been a minute. Uh, I'm excited to talk about to about all that stuff. So so um it's a it's a um story I'm excited to tell. So well, great. So we have a batch of images to share um with everyone, but before we get started um with those, I know your work, Glenn, mostly through a number and I'm sure most people would agree with me, a number of environmental-based works or scale works that really tackle um, often very powerful social issues and um, are really uh, characterized, I would say, by their complexity. Uh, I first, despite respecting you and, and loving your work, I first, I think the first time I literally fell off my seat was seeing your work in Prospect 3 uh, in New Orleans um, in 2015. And then after that, seeing your project with Tommy Smith, seeing your Mass Mocha project last year, and though I haven't seen it yet, um, Aki's Market uh, in LA, all of these projects really are about sort of community building, I would say, in the most fundamental way. And I was wondering if you could just address how your kind of evolution through those last, say, eight or nine years has um, has started for you. Yeah, I think that uh, I mean, what what um, 
you know, thank you for, 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 for that. And, and thank you for creating prospect. I mean, having the opportunity to do that was, was great. Um, you know, I think the, the a commonality is that when I got out of grad school, um, the, I went to UC Irvine for undergrad, uh, UC San Diego for grad school. And when I got out of grad school, um, it was right post the era in art that, that is commonly known as the culture wars. Um, a lot of, um, uh, ideas around the, um, the challenge of the, uh, efficacy and, 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 and value of, of conceptual art practice was, was being, you know, um, mediated and, and the art world offered me a bunch of binaries. So the world at large offered me a lot of binaries, right? It was like, you could be and do the art world, um, or you could do media and other world. You can't do both. And even the art world, it was you can engage in the discourse of beauty because um, there was a resurgence of obviously the dialogue of that almost as a, 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 an anti-political uh, strategy. Or you could d d dive into politics and, and, and you know, um, in a deeper way. And I said, why do I have to choose? Why can't I do both? You know, and so now I think we could get down to the early mid 90s. Would I be? Yeah, mid 90s. Right? Yeah, mid 90s. Mid -90s. And, and I, I, I said, you know. What I, I started a small studio in downtown LA and I said, you know, I'm going to um, start with ideas that in the, in the space of art, in the context of art, that challenge some of the, um, you know, bigger problems, uh, uh, you know, let's say that, that I saw. Um, and then, and then um, you know, if and when some of those ideas manifest in, to new ideas that I felt were, were valuable for the world, uh, uh, you know, that merited bigger publics, you know, maybe I would you know, um, uh, do something, you know, wider, you know, so to speak. And, you know, to that extent, <laughs> you know, because I, I still fundamentally believe and, and hope that art, you know, and, and the institutional practice of art, let's say more so than maybe the commercial practice, but, uh, but we'll talk about that when we talk about the commercial show, but I still believe that the institutional practice of art is one of the last places in the world that um, without like a distinct, ROI or, 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 you know, return on investment is what they call it, or KPI, you know, key performance indicator. You know, it's like, it's, a, you know, the, 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 what, what we're encouraged to do as artists in, in the space of art is to imagine, you know, we're professional imaginers and we think about new worlds and we think about new ideas and new ways that the world can be. And, um, and, and, you know, that's a sacred space that I, I, I fundamentally believe is important to still preserve. Um, that being said, if, if we make a discovery, you know, that we think can be influential, sometimes the space of art maybe doesn't have the reach that some of the more um, base and uh, uh, commercial aspects uh, uh, of media culture have, you know, and so so I definitely early on in my career saw a migratory path from attacking really hard problems rigorously, uh, but understanding that there needed to be a distillation in some capacity. And I had really great mentors, um, a, a person named Jimmy Iovine and, and Oprah Winfrey and people who I've met and worked, done projects with who have really helped me on on that side of the case, uh, you know, equation. And I've had some of the best curators in the world to sort of give me guidance and whatnot, yourself and other people, you know. And so so I've really had the benefit of a lot of wisdom of of, of people um, before me and smarter than me to, to help put some of these things together. And, you know, for all the cases that you talked about, you know, the tank project in New Orleans, um, the Tommy project and, 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 and um, uh, you know, they all began with like a distinct and, and, and inquiry, you know, into an idea. Um, actually the tank project started with me discovering uh, I had a phone, like this is back in the day before even even a lot of, sort of the, before the U.S. government was really uh, digitized. Um, I, I saw in a National Geographic a photo of uh, a tank underwater, you know, um, gr growing corals. And I, I, I wrote the army, you know, division that it was from. And they sent me a manila envelope with a bunch of slides in it. It was like in the mid 90s, late 90s. And, and, um, and the program was called... They just sent it to me. It was like Freedom of Information Act stuff. Like you had to write forms and stuff. But, you know, they, and they sent me like you know, these slides and, and, and the program was called Refex and it was like um, a, um, a, uh, a program where they like, did, like wreck, you know, they put the detritus of war into the ocean to create artificial coral reefs. And they called it mm -hmm. EcoNet positive, despite the rust and the oils and the blah, 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 you know, uh, because fish and, um, you know, barnacles were inhabiting the carcasses of these old war machines. You know, and for me, I thought, well, what a poetic and horrible paradox, like being, you know, beneath the ocean surface, uh, the smallest organisms of the world are reclaiming the instruments of displacement, you know, of, of some of the <laughs> largest, you know, and, and, and uh, so, so on occasion, I like to say on occasion, I'll get a call from a curator. And for me, I'm fortunate. It's happened a number of times. I get a call from a curator that says, do you have an impossible project? 
that may or may not work <laughs> that you can't afford to make <laughs> that, we, that you want to show <laughs> Absolutely no commercial applicability whatsoever. With nothing, absolutely zero commercial viability. Um, and so, and so, um, and and then so for, I I so I got the call and I, I the curator was Stacy Switzer and I showed her the 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 this the picture of this tank and then and then and then um, uh, we ended up through a program called Grand Arts in Kansas City uh, renting an M60 tank. I cast it into seventeen different parts. I, I, I traveled around the country to find the best coral scientists in the world and convince them to join my uh, uh, strange band of art people um, connected with the NRDC um, who, who had told me that the oceans were the least invested natural resource because no one think everyone thinks that the ocean's going to be fine because of the vast volume but also I believe it's the perception of invisibility you can't see below the surface um, so together don't over two and a half about. years yeah exactly don't worry about it. ocean will fix itself a lot of water there a lot of water a lot um, of water and, and, and um you know, we built a lab and over two years grew corals um, on my cast sculptural pieces. Um, and we even sort of built the tanks that work like infinity pools, the water um, float over the surface. Usually when I'm doing this talk, I have an image, uh, but but float over the surface. Mm -hmm. And and uh, what happens though at the end, like um, what was w wonderful and what predictable, but what uh, we were able to demonstrate is when corals encroach upon each other's terrain, you know, um, after time, and this is their years of growth, um, every night they actually fight at the borders. They sting each other with tentacles and, and, and chemical warfare. Um, and so, so, you know, what the writing ended up being you, myself, a bunch of, we well wrote about, which was, wow, you know, what, what another sort of contradictory sort of moment to understand and perceive, right? Like, uh, beneath the ocean surface, non-intelligent actors create colonial nation states that look similar to the geographies from which we define ourselves that fight at the borders for their own, you know, and, and it really began to beg the question of what is the nature of man in Hobbes Leviathan and this idea that like, uh, what, what, at least for me, what it came out was the, the thinking that, you know, everyone says like stop war and you'll have peace as if, if we understand entropy and the idea that an agitated state can be stopped and war is the agitated state. But I think what this piece demonstrated was perhaps that, war and aggression is is a natural state you know for 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 the world in a way and our humanity it's a default, position, it's a default position you know and our humanity is actually bought with our effort for peace you know that's sort of what, what that's the, the differentiating factor is that we can actually sacrifice for peace you know we, we can actually compromise and, and and do things and that's sort of what the with the poetry of that work so so uh, you know not only did i you know to your point like a lot of people visually you know it was striking and and achieved the level of what I, I i was hoping for you know but i think um poetically you know and 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 um uh it was it was that as well and um you know and so all all the work i mean tommy smith is the, is a very similar you know um situation you know tommy was i got, I, I had a four by five image of 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 the salute like a little, you know, but, but this big, you know, uh, uh, taped to you the corner. It all. literally taped to the, no, taped to the bottom right hand corner of my, my, my iMac, you know, and a buddy of mine walked in the studio and he says, Coach Smith, you want to meet him? <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Coach Smith want to meet him. Like, Coach, uh, yeah. Like coach is only something you, someone something you call somebody who's actually coached you, right? Like I know people yeah. are coaches. I don't call them coach, right? Um, yeah. and, and so my friend happened to be one of his star athletes. Um, as a, as a kid, when he was teaching at Santa Monica College, so he he actually started texting the Smith family right there in my studio, and 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 came back a minute later and said they want to meet you, and I said what are you talking about? They want to meet you? I didn't even know if the guy was alive or or, or whatnot, you know, um, and and uh, so I uh, but I booked two tickets to meet him in his house in Atlanta, and we sat down on this couch, and he actually played the race that he won, like step by step in slow motion and I, I had chills i was like oh my god you know i'm in the house of a legend and and um it was really great on an hour on the hour of the conversation his wife the lois who who's now a good friend and and also his manager uh, cuts him off and says tommy shut up glenn why are you here <laughs> <laughs> She's like, perfect, tommy perfect. will talk all night long if you let him but we need to know why you're here you know and i said hey i'm not here to pitch you anything i'm a conceptual artist i got I'm just here to, I mean, I'm just grateful to be here, you know, but I said, I do have an observation if I may. And they said, what is it? I said, it strikes me that you little, live in a bit of a time bubble. 
And they say, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, for I was born after that happened. So for me, it's always been a picture, right? But for you, it's very personal. Like you shook my hand at the door. You, 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 you brush your teeth with the hand. Like you drive with the hand. The rest of us, we all just know the hand in the air. And I said, what if we could collaborate on something that, that, that is functions in the now, allowing you to be a witness for this rich history that you've inspired in all of us. And at that point, they're about to cry. We're all about to cry. And he says, what do we do next? I said, you come to LA and I'll take the arm off your body. And they're like, what are you talking about? Take the arm off my body. I said, no, 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 no. I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a cast. I'm going to make a cast. I'm not going to cut your arm off. I'm going to make a cast. And so, so I make a cast of his arm. And then when the cast came out, he pointed at, um, he pointed at this bump that's on the side of his arm right here. And I thought it was this bump that we had, this bone that we all have, you know, it, it's not. He points and he says, he says, you know what that is, son? I said, you know, what is that, sir? He says, that's a class muscle. I said, what do you mean? He says, you only get that from picking cotton. So when I'm up there, I flex it to let everyone know that even if you pick cotton, you're up here with me. And I was like, oh, my goodness. Astounding. This is beautiful. So I asked him right then. I asked him, I said, can we film our interactions? Because I, I believe these are stories that that people haven't heard. And he says, absolutely. And, 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 I, and I convinced a friend of mine. Um, who well, I've done films with to, to help me. And we, we went on a journey and, and, um, and then they sent me on this amazing, so sort of, not goose chase, but amazing circuitous path where, where we, they sat down they said, well, we have three goals for this partnership. I said, I said, great. Cause I have a zero. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. I'm just happy to be here. You know? And, and they said, well, great. Cause one, we want to meet Oprah. <laughs> and they said, two, <laughs> they said, two, we want to, we want to be in the Smithsonian. And they, and they, and, and they said, they said, three, we want to meet the president. Now, this is 2015, just so we're all president. clear. Yeah, just so we're clear. It's President Obama, just you know. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of presidents. But uh, but uh, President Obama, and and um, and so I said, great. So and and as I mentioned, I spent a lot of time with Oprah Winfrey. So I I, I saw her a few 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 days later, and I said, Oprah, like I'm working with Tommy Smith, and Oprah's phenomenal. You know, she's like Tommy Smith, Tommy Smith. You know, she's like I know she knew exactly. Who was. Yeah, yeah. She Oprah. She's like I'll see him tomorrow. I was like, oh my god, I'm the. I'm the maker of dreams, you know? And so, and so, and so I called Tommy. I said, Hey, I got you to meet with Oprah. And he says, um, I'm too old to get on a plane right now to go see her. I'll be, we'll get it some other time. I said, no, you're not. You have no idea how hard that ask is. And, and, uh, and he passed. Now, uh, Dan, uh, Brooklyn rail, uh, my hundred and eighty first <laughs> podcast. If, 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 if y'all ask me to do three impossible things, uh, and I, uh, do the first one and you pass, I'm just gonna let you know right now up front, like I'm off the hook. <laughs> I feel no, you got, uh, you're on your way with the other two. <laughs> yeah, because like I, 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 you know, I, you gave me three. I did the first one. They're all impossible. Um, and and so and so um, but you're genius, hard, Glenn. <laughs> you know, and so and so and so um, but not with the not with the Smiths. So so they called me. I remember six months later they called me up in February of 2016, and and Deloa said, um, she said I just want to remind you, you're on the clock. I said, what does that mean? She says we want to meet the president, not the ex president. Ooh. And I was like, oh, man. And so I called everyone that I knew that knew President Obama. We had a lot of, strangely, a lot of mutual friends. Uh, I called Thelma. Thelma was on the, Thelma was at the top of Aspen Mountain with the Astor Gates. And, 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 and I heard them on speakerphone. That, they're like, sorry, bud, can't help you. <laughs> it, everyone was like, like, you know, very hard ass, basically. And I ended up calling the White House every day until they got tired of me. And, 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 they, and they said, finally, like, we'll, get, we'll, we'll get you in in September. I was like, no, no, no. He's going to be campaigning in September. Then they said, well, you know, uh, finally they said, well, we'll get you in. Um, it, all you have to do is get to D.C. on official business and we'll up your security clearance. And then and then if the president wants to see you, he'll, he'll let you in. And so, so yeah, they right should be easy. They didn't know that I just had met Lonnie Bunch. And Lonnie oh, had oh, not, oh, he was, he was, he was building the Museum of African American History and Culture, but he had not secured anything from Tommy because Tommy was a so, until then, unwilling give him anything because he didn't know how institutional stewardship worked and so so i brokered that deal and then this Lonnie, to, for, for, for tommy's our archive half the archive to be in the smithsonian and then and then yeah. uh and, which and, was uh, request uh, number two or number three i can't remember but oh, yeah. it was on the list <laughs> yeah and so 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 uh then damien and, and 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 lonnie's team called and said well we'll send an art handler to your studio to pick it all up Glenn. and i said no 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 we'll hand deliver it we just need security clearance and and uh and so they, they they did it and then um on my birthday like uh i flew i flew the team to dc with a bunch of free stuff for lonnie and no invitation to the white house <laughs> and we're sitting in a hotel uh -huh. in dc and this is how it happens on my birthday 
they invited us into the Oval Office, and I was able to introduce um, Tommy to President Obama. I like, long, long story to say, um, the fast forward is I was able to get Tommy on the cover of a, a, a Wheaties box for the first time by calling the CEO of Wheaties. I ended up getting Tommy uh, a, a headphone collab with Beats headphones. We got 4.6 billion impressions on Beats. Wow. We got 1.4 1, 1. billion impressions on, on the Wheaties box, the first artist design Wheaties box ever. Um, you know, and and uh, uh, I, I introduced Tommy to Colin Kaepernick and we ended up um, uh, getting nominated for an Emmy for our, our film that we made together. Um, and, and that documents all this with John Arms and Apple. Um, yeah. And, and, and uh, most, most excitingly, though, the main sculpture, Bridge, um, was acquired by the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And that opens uh, oh, this, this, this summer. Um, and so, so um, well, it gets installed this, this summer. And so um, we're, we're very excited about that opening up really soon. And so, um, but yeah, you know, so again, just by way of other projects, like, you know, all of these things started sort of with the germination of something that I felt needed to be told or explored in a way that needed support and needed to bring communities together. And, you know, when Tommy said to me that the salute was for all human rights and as a, as a, and this will get into the pace show, but as, as you know, as a Japanese American artist, as an Asian American artist, you know, I had that photo there as an icon of solidarity of sacrifice, of change, you know, um, and and it was courage. A very courage, you know, and and for him to say um, what I felt was a, a generous intersectional, you know, um, allyship um, sort of sentiment with the idea that that was for human rights and that included me, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I, I thought, wow, this is an amazing thing that I think can be a galvanizing moment. And and then to your point, I think. Uh, I, I love the power of people and the imagination and 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 I have a distinct sensibility of our uniqueness and 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 love to 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 meander around the texture of uniqueness you know and 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 so when when Tommy has been mis misunderstood and you know um, uh, ostracized you know for me you know to collaborate with him you know has been a wonderful adventure and, and most of my projects Mass Mocha all comes from the same space of of thinking. But it also, I, I just, I'm amazed by, in a, in a way, you're sharing the story, the the role that serendipity played. If you hadn't had the photo at that moment, and if that particular coworker hadn't walked in and hadn't been looking over your shoulder at that particular angle and said, hey, that's Coach Smith, none of this would have ever happened. I mean, it, there's like a parallel world in which, you know, you're not there <laughs> to make, to yeah. be the cat. For all these things to happen because once you see the injustice it seems it's very hard to not want to do something about it yeah absolutely i i think that that's why for me the studio is so important and and you know that's why art's so important because you know in in that way like if my friend hadn't come by and seen that but like the way the haphazardly organized way that i keep the studio and with all the different inspiration all around it's like you know, it, it, it's a, it's a lab of manifesting, you know, in a way. And, and, and so, um, you know, for me, I call it the constellation of concerns, you know, there are 18 or 20 things that I have had a long-term investment in that all, all my projects touch, you know, certain points of it, you know, it, people's like, Oh, your work's not about this or your work's not about that. I say, yeah, well, you know, I have a body of work called, you know, so one crisis at a time. Work. Yeah, it's like, like you know, there's a lot of ground. There's no such thing as like one crisis at a time, right? Like we're we're, we're dealing with a lot of stuff, you know. And I, I think that the the falsehood is that like we have to and are only able to think about one thing. Now, clearly, I'm also as you, you know a, a a champion of expertise. You know, I believe in putting the time in. You know, I believe in making high quality work. Um, but but I do think that you know for me you know, for, for now over 20 years, like it's been a long-term investment into not only just ideas, but craftsmanship, you know, that allows this level of, of, of uh, manifestation to happen, you know? And so all, all the works I could point to like, ah, oh, serendipitous moment <laughs> where, where something just connected with something and then just catalyzed into a project that was a hundred times what anyone thought the first meeting would be. All my work in magic, you know, I, I had a chance of meeting course. an interest in magic. Oh. That ended up oh, with a show called in and of itself that was like the hit of Hulu and you know my, my partner Derek Delgado and I you know um performed for a decade Trump together. Performa. Yeah that might have been the last time I oh, saw yeah, that. Yeah, but, yeah, that was like that was yeah. Well Performa was the first performance that D Derek and I did as a duo. You didn't see in and of itself at the Daryl Raw Theater, otherwise you would have remembered. But please see it. Um it it, it uh, you would be really proud having seen the performa piece to mm -hmm. to, to, to that evolution to what happened there. 
um, because what we were able to do is create um, a lens into the complication of identity in a way that probably touched 20 million people so far. So, yeah. um, well, um, I, I, it looks like it's time to, time <laughs> to, to magically segue to nimbly segue into the show that just opened it opened last week or over the weekend uh last week yeah yeah last week um so can you talk a little bit about the body of work as yeah. such and your yeah. title for the show? yeah I'll, well i'll connect those stories to, to as, a, as a segue because i think that one of the things that was also sort of a, a commonality you know for the first sets of work is that when i got out of school what what i what i you know um when i got out of school i was told by um almost every curator and every dealer in, in, that I ever met, you know, for the first five or 10 years of my career um, to not do anything related to being Asian American. Right. Huh, distinctly, you know, distinctly. They said, they said, you'll be marginalized. Whatever you do, whatever you do li literally, that. whatever you do, that's the, that's the third way. Right. Don't, don't do that. Cause your career will be over. Right. And, and they said, and, and, you know, I, I think it was like a, a problematic, um, uh, and, and, and false association with whiteness. There's a lot of like things that went along with that. Um, but, but, um, and, but I internalized that, you know, and, and the, and the, and the parallel phrase that was offered to me at the same time was don't do anything about being Asian, but also ask bigger questions. And so I spent 20 years making work that asked the biggest questions or tried to, you know, and scaffold up to bigger questions, bigger questions. They got and bigger. I, they got bigger. <laughs> and, and, um, you know, when I was making the physically and, contextually biggest show ever at mass mocha i was working on the book for the show you know and and um i was interviewing writers and um uh, an, uh, an awesome writer named amir who's in the show i mean the book uh we finished our general meeting like this you know without 50 people on the call uh me and him and and we finished and, and we know we go on for a couple hours and we we end and my, my part ends and he says you know your career has been fantastic. You've worked with some of the craziest people and the biggest names in the world, attacking the biggest problems in the world. He says, I only write about the smallest unknown people and my stories are the most universal. And, and, and it knocked me back in my chair, you know, and I, I, and I, I, I was like, so um, humbled, caught off guard, you know, and I, and I, and then all these memories of being a young artist, like with people giving me that advice. Ooh, came through. Wow. And Sorry. So I said, no, 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 no. You, you, I'm, and that's the reaction that I had, you know, and, and I, I said to, I said, you know, what's the small story I want to tell? And so this quickly rounding through Aki's market into this show, I said, I said, um, I'm going to paint a, sh I want to do a show about my grandfather named Akira, you know, uh, who had this store called Aki's market. So I called my mom and I said, mom, I'd like to tell the story of grandpa. He died two years before I was born. Right. Uh -huh. But I, I, I have the Akira poster behind me because, um, you know, in, in his honor. And, and uh, my mom said, she said, um, we're humble people. Our stories don't deserve to be told. Those were her words. Those were her words. Right. And so I go, Oh, you know what? Just for that, I'm telling it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You just sealed the deal, Ma. <laughs> exactly. So I, I, I started to work on this show and the, the reception has been great. And I felt really, I felt really good about it. And so this body of work at pace comes out of the show at, Aki's, uh, at, at the Japanese American museum, um, that has paintings in it for for the first time in a long time. I showed paintings at the project years ago, um, but but um, and so it's a series of it's it's a, it's one body of work called Walking with the Tiger. Um, I invoke the, the the tiger iconography a lot in the show, um, particularly in the in in invoking the concept of the diaspora because there are never actually Jap tigers that lived in Japanese forests. Tigers are not indigenous to Japan. Right. But there's a lot of tiger iconography like Nike shoes comes from a company called Onisuka Tiger. But there were never any tigers in Japan, which is hilarious, because for me, it's like a it's like a it's like a mythology of diaspora, which is like I never lived in Japan either. You know, and, and so I, I okay. sort of internalized okay. that we're we're Japanese tigers. Um, the 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 can we go back to the first image, Chloe? The, the, uh, and so, so it's a, it's a, it's a yeah. So it's it's a series of, of um, it's three three sets of work that are all conceptually intertwined into this notion of 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 tigers and, and and whatnot and you know tigers being asian american um people tigers being like this iconography of this kit and you know um and so um and, and so the portraits the first portraits and this one is you can hear the next one uh, Chloe, is a, a portrait of a fellow named daniel uh, uh shimizu who was the first legendary one of the first legendary japanese and the coolest japanese skateboarder um 
And what I would do for all these portraits, and you'll see more, um, is actually I started with the blank canvas and I I painted the um, the figure, and and uh, I sort of like recorded my emotional sentiment and sort of notes. And and, and um, when I was painting the figure, you know, knowing that, for example, conceptually for me, a commercial gallery uh, one as significant as pace is sort of a, a site where not only meaning is arbitrated, but a site where value itself right is 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 arbitrated Absolutely. and, and so as i'm as i'm painting it you know um thinking about the heavy influence and my my reverence for my friends who have really pushed forth the black portraiture movement and you know uh, uh, and representational artwork and other 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 um uh uh you know other other groups you know i i was like do asian folks have value you know like like will these have any value Right. Sooner or later, the question gets asked, doesn't it? It, gets, it, well, it? it hasn't been asked because I couldn't find really great representations of Asian American artists painting Asian Americans. I'm sure they're there. I, I asked 12 curators, 15 curators. We couldn't figure out a, a good one. And so what I did doing this, I took a, a rag of solvent and I would just leave it here. I actually would erase the entire painting. Right. And strangely enough, the 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 feeling of erasure felt way more comfortable and safe. Right. And then I would paint the back the foreground again while I was working the background, and the background would progressively become more abstract. Uh, we can go probably, maybe to the next one. Um, the background would be more abstract, um, and then oh yeah, well actually don't no, go back, leave that. One. Um, sorry, and 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 um and the backgrounds began to have a conversation with abstract expressionism and and Klein, right? And and yeah. and um and 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 as I did dug in more conceptually, I found out Klein early in Klein's career had a distinct relationship with Japanese calligraphers, right? And and uh, they put him on the cover of a magazine called Boku Jinkai magazine. And, you know, they, they, they uh, he, wrote, he, he wrote letters to the calligraphers uh, thanking them for being an honorary part of the Japanese calligraphy community, blah, blah, blah. For letting, so, for, for letting for let, him. Let, Including him, letting him into the Japanese calligraphy community, just like having that association. So the war happens, post-war, uh, the rise of American abstract expressionism, right? Uh, Klein uh, asked Greenberg to rewrite the history books, literally to disavow any influence from Japanese people, right? Come to find out in recent years, in the last five years, about the amount of money that the CIA put into MoMA and put into Greenberg specifically as a, as a historian to create a propagandistic sort of overvaluation of American art as a means of cultural capital and hegemonic practice, right? Um, you know, it makes perfect sense that you disavow any connection to Japan, <laughs> right? You know, Especially in the, in the post-war years. Post-war year, right? And so for right. me, I was like, oh, the only thing I knew were two or three things. One is that my characters and my figures were going to stand out on top and in front of that story. So they proudly are in front of that. But the remnants and the time machines and the scars of, of if you go to the close-up, the scars of the backgrounds, um, like you can see under on his forehead, um, uh, uh, come through. Um, I started to at some point heavily impasto the clothing uh, so that I couldn't. It was like a, it was a challenge for me because I couldn't erase it once I put the impasto on. So there's distinct layers of them, and and um, uh, and, and that's sort of like the methodology, let's say, behind the portraits. And we could cruise through the next few slides. Um, yeah, we're going to land on sculptures as well. But could you talk yeah, about yeah. these? We may have close-ups even. Yeah, we have close-ups of the sculptures. But here we can go to the next slide, Chloe. Yeah, so walking through the show, um, yeah, there, well, there, we, we'll, we'll, we'll do the, we can do the sculptures first and then we'll do the embroideries last, I guess. Yeah, let's do that. You're right. Yeah. Good idea. So, so um, yeah, so actually, Chloe, can you go to the sculptures? Yeah. Um, and so, again, in thinking about the diaspora as a time machine um, and thinking about, you know, I've been in a lot of conversations with Asian American filmmakers about, you know, this moment um, and, and, and how this moment you know, is, is, is preserved and extended and not just like a, a blip. And, you know, um, I was thinking about, you know, the fact that even though the artifacts might not um, persist, the concepts persist, you know? And so this is the, this is the shape of a samurai Kabuto helmet created from detritus from my studio. So these are my, I, I, I was, I was kicked out of five high schools as a, as, as a kid, as a grew up in Asian gangs, you know, in a, in a, in a sort of, hunt meandering hunt for for understanding masculinity in the asian american japanese american um and, and the way i got out of gangs was through hip-hop and through being a dj but my friends being now world famous djs um but but uh 
Uh, and so, you know, this is an homage to, 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 to that past. And so those are my old techniques, 1200s, DJ turntables that the record uh, okay. is. Uh, I just uh, recognized them. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and the, the whole thing is made of like melted dent records. And then the, the, the big record on top sort of is a, is a record called all night fish, which is the, the, the sample when you drop on the first track is um, it's time it's time. And it's sort of like a, a, a one of the, um, most commonly used scratch samples of the of the eighties. Um and I think there's probably another, maybe another one. Um no, sculpture. 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 Yeah. yeah. Uh there's like an yeah. LA one. Uh yeah. And so this is like this is the first one I made out of my uh, out of my LA hat. Um so sort of, you know shop pencils, home depot shop pencils with like spackle knives and whatnot. And um if you go to see the show, so some of them this one has like uh, uh, interior lining <laughs> inside. So it's like a Louis Vuitton lining. Um, so they're all like, they're all, um, you know, again, they're, 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 um, imaginations of like a future past, right. They're like, what if, you know, uh, what do the, what is like warlord di diasporatic culture look like hidden in pockets, you know, that is like waiting to be assembled, waiting to be reconfigured, waiting to invoke that past, you know, in, 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 in a way. And, um, and I, I think if we're going to just jump around like this, uh, why don't we go to Chloe, if you could find it, there's a, uh, a set of embroideries with the tigers, with the, with the um, uh, threads that connect them. Yeah. That's an incredible piece. Like the, it's like seven, seven. Uh, yeah. Right there. Oh I see. yeah. Right there. Yeah. And so, and so, um, so these are all based off of um, old kit embroidery, color by number embroidery kits that were created for Japanese Americans post-war. And and the story is really like, you know, when 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 Japanese folks primarily were 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 um incarcerated in, in concentration right. camps in the 1940s, um, you know, the, the people don't know the US military burned every book that had any Japanese text and it destroyed every record and every audio sample that anything that sounded like Japanese, along with giving Japanese people a loyalty questionnaire that said like, are you an American? Right. And, and patriot, patriotism classes. And so when they left the camp, largely the connection between the homeland was severed, both emotionally, patriotically, physically, you know, and, and, and it was yeah, logistically, it was very hard to get things from Japan and, and uh, come to uh, a, 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 a trinket manufacturer making embroidery kits of like ancient Japanese artworks and it's like embroidered by numbers. It's called Bunka Sishu and they call it oil painting and thread. And my great grandmother learned to do it, and my, she she taught my grandmother, and 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 um, and, and I saw uh, there, and so for me, I, I noticed that a lot of that tigers, and again to the tiger m m modality, and this this one is sort of intended to um, imply the diaspora, uh, invisible tigers because the bodies are not rendered, invisible tigers connected, you know, with their own threads, you know, in a manner that looks like a flight tracker, but it looks like a map, it's like a cartography of a di of, a, of an imagined diaspora. Um, if we go to the last one, I know we're running short on time of the Kabuki dancer with the hair. Um, yeah, right there, right. So, so uh, just like um, turn, turn in the last corner and, and sort of abbreviate this a little bit. So, the Kabuki dancer kit was the ultimate kit in the whole series. Right, it's the hardest to make. You had the the best threads, had the gold and other threads. And my grandmother, uh, who just recently passed uh, over the holidays, but my grandmother. Um, who was the wife of Aki for Aki's Market, and, and she was the she was the matriarch of our family. She made one of these for every adult member of the family except for me. <laughs> and and uh, but she was getting to you. No, no, no. She offered it to me. I, I actually, I actually chose. You I, I chose. I passed. I, cho I chose a set of like brothers because like at the at the family meeting where she offered it to everyone, there was these two brothers sets. And and honestly, selfishly, I was like, you know, collaboration means a lot to me, as you know, as like we've discussed. And so the two brothers were good luck together. And it was always a reminder of me of the spirit of like connection with people. And, and selfishly, I thought I'll just get one later too because like she's making these for everybody, right? And then, right. Um, and then you made this. They stopped making. They stopped making the kits, and she stopped making them at all. So I, I never got one, right? And so before this show, I actually found, I, I searched for about two years. I found what I think to be one of the last, well, I know it's one of the last, I don't know if it is the last, but I, certainly one of the last kits available. And and uh, over Thanksgiving. Um, Somebody bought it and then hung on to it or hid it, it away. It was just like, so it was literally in someone's like closet. And it was like, it was in the closet yeah. of like a Japanese American cultural center in Seattle. Uh, I found it in their old inventory. And, and, um, 
and uh, I, I loaded the needle and I, and I shoved it in front of my grandmother at Thanksgiving and I had her do that small stitch that you see um, really? a single stitch uh, right on the f- knee foot of the, of the dancer. Um, yeah. Right there, right. Your cursor just passed it. Um, and, and uh, look, left a little bit left a little bit right there, right there. So my grandmother did that stitch and I actually invented the rest of the stitches. I called it an open thread because the rest of them are normally well, tight, tightly stitched. Um, I created this stitch called, I, I call it an open thread and invoking sort of thoughts of technology, but unfinished business. And also it looks like paint, dripping paint um, to really honor this notion that, you know, some of this work that we're doing is, is un, un, unfinished, you know? And, and um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's my grandmother's last stitch. Um, brought it in 90 seconds under time. What, <laughs> what else you got for me? <laughs> I could amazing. talk for, I could talk for hours. So, so um you know, we'll, we'll stop there and maybe take questions or whatever. Um, well, actually, I think we, I, I'm not sure. Is it time for questions? Oh, maybe yeah, we, we, we don't have to. I, I, I'm, I'm happy. We've, to. we've got a bit of time. Feel free we to do. keep oh, okay, talking yeah, yeah. a bit about the works. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, um, yeah. Could we uh, continue to walk through a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. More things individually. Yeah, absolutely. Like- yeah. Let's go look at the back wall of the, that, that installation shot of all the back wall paintings. Well, well, we can talk about yeah, any. So, so um, there are two groups of people that I painted. Um, one group is a group of young people who I took hundreds of photos of street photography, and um, I and, and so the the woman on the right represents she's one of four of the of of younger people who I actually don't know, um, and and I chose them uh, for their stare, and, and I and I did that because. Having done a little bit, you know, a lot of research, but not really finding distinct um, uh, moments where, again, in 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 a setting um, like a commercial, major commercial gallery, uh, that Asian Americans were represented in this way, I wanted to make sure that, like, if this was and is a first entry into that dialogue, that our people weren't um, submissive or being judged. I wanted them to confidently, you know, engage with an audience and emotionally engage. You know, in a, in a very decisive, um, equitable way. You know, and that was that was most important to me. Um, so the most important thing for these works is like their 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 eyes and the gaze and their posture. Um, and then also with uh, Daniel Shimizu, Shimizu. Yeah, Daniel. Daniel, Daniel, Daniel as well. Yeah, yeah. And so Daniel, I know, and the other group of people are are, are four um, Asian Americans that I looked up to and look up to. You know, and so so the the, the on the left or the person on the left of the last slide was Michael Jew, the artist. Oh um, sure, and then the other wall, you'll see that there's a two smaller paintings. That's um, Yuka Honda, um, not here, but like um, there's a there's two stits on the other opposite wall. There's two. Um, well, these are the three. Those are the three that I don't know. Um, okay, on one so, wall. Yeah, so so that is right there, Yuka Honda um, from a band called Chibomato that I used to love growing sure. up. And, love and, and um, and then the right is a fellow named Money Mark. Um, who was also in the Beastie Boys? That's money. That's Mark there on the. Whoa. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Mark was also in the Beastie Boys. I mean, besides having an illustrious solo career, was in the Beastie Boys and wrote many, many, many of the of the most important um, riffs for Beck and a bunch of really great people. But you know, m- money, Mark, Yuka Honda. If you, you'd ask me as a as a you know fifteen year old Japanese kid if you'd ever like hang out and know those people, I'm like, there's no way. Those are like, you know, they're legends. Um, and, and, um, you know, so, so super exciting for me to, to be able to paint them now. And, um, again, the other three paintings, um, maybe you can get to the wall with the three paintings, um, uh, possible. Where are you from? Okay. Sorry, Chloe, Chloe, you've done a really great job. This is like, I, I just, um, spaghetti this entire talk. Uh, but, but, uh, yeah, so these three are, are the other, um, young folks who, who I, I say, I wish I knew growing up, you know, the confidence in their presentation was something that that I, I I love, you know, and and meant everything to me to see a generation of Asian Americans out there on the street, you know, that 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 um have that, and so um you know. So do you me, walk the street with a camera and approach total strangers and ask them? For the most part, yeah, because you got to get a release these days. <laughs> you know, it, it ain't like in the eighties. Um, you got to get a release these days. Yeah, yeah, and so so um, you know, and 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 um, yeah. You know, and I think that it's a, it's a, 
you know, with social media culture, what it is and, and, and thinking about representation, you know, it's, it's, a, it's sometimes easier, sometimes harder, you know? Um, but yeah, I think all, all of that, you know, they're all, they're all, they're all equivalent to the tigers to me. And they're all equivalent to, to, to defying this kit, of how we've been instructed to behave, how we've been instructed to be, you know, from a classical sense, you know, and we're, we're really in unknown territory, you know, in, in, in representation, which is exciting because I think that, you know, um, for, for uh, you know, what I, it, it, in the diaspora for Asian Americans is distinctly different, you know, than, than for example, um, African-American diaspora, which, because, you know, slavery as a, as a, as a, like a horrific rupture between the history, you know, of, uh, African Americans from from the motherland, you know, which which is like a, an erasure, you know, um, the 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 genocide of Native Americans, right? Like these are these are you know um, institutional attempts to stomp and to to destroy the lineage. Asian Americans, but for the most part, the the diaspora is voluntary, right? It, it, in a way, you know, the, the treatment and reception um, w w was also story. yeah, it was another story. So it, it, look, that was a sort of imperity with like we hate everybody, but but. Uh, uh, d distinctly, you know, and then Japanese with the with the uh, incarceration, and you know, um, Chinese with the impression, you know, they, everyone is sort of, uh, but th that has given the Asian American diaspora a, a really conflicted sense of uh, wanting to belong in a way where 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 like my ancestors felt like guests, right? And 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 there's a humility around that, which is like our humble people, where all that stuff comes from linearly, you know, which which has not created the most um flourishing environment for for different types of creative expression let's say you know whereas i would say like you know um other cultural representations you know when you have to build up a history from scratch right you know because you don't know where you how your ancestors got here you know you, by nature there's an inventiveness of the need and the thirst and the uh, you know to create a culture you know and so um for me, like the Asian American diaspora, like we, I, I felt always like invisible and hidden because I don't really feel like I have a distinct connection to a motherland. So th those histories, even though they're popular, um, they don't belong to me, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But and and even in, and so they, you know, connect to the art world. You know, people would say like if you get if you put Takeshi Murakami in like a um in a, in a in a in an international biennial, you know, you get all of Japan. And Takeshi, <laughs> you know, if you put Glenn, exactly. if you put Glenn Kaino uh, in 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 a big exhibition around the world, you get a small slice of East LA, <laughs> you know, you get a suburb, <laughs> you know. It's like there's not a lot of like um, they're there, let's say, in terms of that. And so, so for me to have these moments where um, I'm trying to uh, assert and like just make a, the smallest cultural space, you know, without having to feel like I have to rely on like being like an advanced technology artist you know or or constantly and only address large-scale scientific issues or, or 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 climate issues or or allyship which i do still well you i was know? gonna i was gonna say the balance of known and unknown um let's call them personalities in the in the portraits here seem to speak to that idea as as you as you said that that some are kind of aspirational and and the rest are people who may very well end up um in the same place five ten years down the line yeah. as the better known subjects but i was also hoping you could um without necessarily going you know zooming in I, is there anything to know about the backgrounds the way that in, in the same way that the uh, that the franz klein looking strokes in the other painting kind of revealed a, a, a layer of history, art history yeah. that wasn't, I'm seeing references here, but I can't quite make them out. Yeah, I would think they all, they all have different relationships to, 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 you know, as they were more abstracted, you know, so I chose black and white because I knew I was going to embark upon this process. So not only was there a lineage of the relationship with street photography, uh, but no, just being, having been trained as a painter, as a, as, as a young artist, like I, I you know, I, I don't want this to be a muddy, mess of you know uh, uh i wanted to be you know um uh legible you know so to speak and so um in, in all of the backgrounds like you see on the right it's hard to tell maybe but like on the right um tara you know uh some of the background of the of the fence sort of bleeds over her shoulders and her shoulders bleed over in other areas you know mm -hmm. and so um you know in in a way um if you if you look the the you know they all sort of function together as a formal painting um but but you know they all reveal between three and eight cycles of erasure um 
depending on the painting. And so uh, Alina on the left, you can't tell from this vantage point, but uh, the, right to the, her, her, to our right, to her left, there is the one of the circular backgrounds of the stones behind her that sort of right. you know, carve into her hair. It kind of looks like just a wave of her hair, but in in fact, like the background, um, and it's very, it's very, um, yeah. So so there you see, but there, but on top of that background, you know, there there are. Uh, three or four layers of other painting on top of that circle even and so you know it, it is a it questions that sort of what point you know was her was she rendered in in, in, in sort of that that composition um you know uh the idea yeah like in kevin right here because by his by our left side his right glasses like the background goes over to his forehead you know there there the moment of you know, us Asian Americans being taught and told to uh, literally been told, hey, just blend into the background. You know, that, that is a phrase oh, spoken no. by my family. Just you know? blend into the background. Oh, yeah. We, we like you're trained to and told to like not be the nail that stands up, blend into the background, you know, and and and, and it's don't like draw attention to you know, yourself. don't draw attention to yourself, right? You know, so with one palette, one color, these people, like the, the these 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 folks are not doing that <laughs> you know and i love it i'm here for it you know um <laughs> and so so again all i knew was that when i was painting them that my like the figuration was going to win and be on top you know even though i was going through this process of 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 erasure you know and invisibility you know i was committed to like that struggle to to do that and and um uh yeah so so um you know, I, 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 when we started out, the, we were talking a little bit about a little bit of a bifurcation between the institutional sector of the art world, which we think of maybe as the R and D end, where you can try yeah. out you know, kind of a large scale laboratory, um, almost you know, format, and then the gallery. And I, I guess that kind of stuck with me a little bit because I was almost expecting, almost expecting, but knowing you, I shouldn't have been expecting work that somehow also bifurcated from the underlying themes that your work has always been about, these kind of bigger questions, you know, about equality and, and social cohesion. And as I see the paintings, the work on view at, at Pace, granted that these are quote unquote conventional media, you're working in oil paint on canvas and sculpture, but there's no bifurcation to me. I'm not seeing any kind of a rift between this work and anything that you've made that's not, pardon the word, commercial. Um, is that, that must be how you see it as well. Yes, and I'd say that like, you know, I'm, I'm so, um, uh, yes, I mean, I see it that way. I, I, I'm really happy, you know, my the, the team I have over at Pace is phenomenal. Um, I, I really think that um, in this draft, in this version of Pace, they have, Mark has really set up the um, the gallery to be able to, bring those elements that we're talking about closer together you know and, and i think that um you know in a way that uh i think other conversations maybe are not so advanced you know and so uh you know it's still the gallery is still i i look at it again conceptually as a site of the negotiation of value right mm -hmm. and and uh and and, there, and there's no question about that but i don't think any any um uh, a creator, young person, you know, anyone who's involved in like the cultural dialogue, um, we, we are not immune to, to, you know, um, you know, there's no moment like there was in the grand heyday of the eighties or late seventies. And I don't even know if those existed back then. <laughs> right. But, but, but certainly it's different now. And so um, I think that the best we can do is to create a complication and, 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 and try to live up to the responsibility of that. And what I try to do here is um, really, um, uh, Put the put the responsibility on myself to do two things really is to create a body of work that was much more emotional than it has ever been um in a way and i think that to to my friends not just like critics and professional art people but to my people who 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 have just followed my career and supported me for 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 years you know to have people who have supported me for 10 years come in the gallery and just like you get 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 super emotional and you're like i knew like this is the show that was in you um you know and 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 uh that's how I feel about this painting when we're looking at right now. Yeah, you know, it, it's a bit, yeah. So this is like the 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 ultimate sort of tiger piece in the show. It's um, you know, it's from a found tiger kit, you know, and 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 it, and also actually the 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 or the the extended threads, you know, to me, they're in conversation with the idea of me wiping off because that's what it looked like when I wiped off yes. the portraits, 
right? right. Turpentine, yeah, dripping. turpentine dripping, you know, and it's like, oh, but you can still see the face legible, but the body is not. Maybe the backgrounds are changing. Maybe the backgrounds are invisible. You know, maybe the background bleeds over the foreground, you know, um, and, and so, um, yeah, I mean, it's really, it's all still conceptually based. But again, I think for me trying to apply the format of the destination and making sure that, you know, they function on a commercial sense um, was something that that is was was the most important thing to me. And, um, yeah. Wait, should we keep walking through a little bit? Yeah, um, please. There's like a Kangol hat that is also really fun that we haven't seen. Well, oh, where I'm are you from? Yeah, let's piece. talk about this one. Yeah. yeah, so this is a triptych and, and, and um, uh, it says, where are you from? And, and, you know, it's like, uh, I'm so happy to see my friend, you know, Ed, Ed show at moment was like, so awesome. First of all, that guy, I mean, come on. Um, Mr. Wait, Richet, uh, Ed Richet's show. Oh, at moment. That your show? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah your, I was, I was like, first of all, can we talk about Ed Richet for another 45 hours? Um, no, but for me, where, 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 where are you from? Um, was a dual, uh, was this wordplay. I mean, um, uh, Sort of like this artificial reminder of where you're from. You actually through the text you can see the instruction kit below because this is actually just three found kits of Mount yeah. Fuji, right? And you can see in the negative space of the text the instructions that were there. So it's like for me it's sort of like a reminder, of, you know, hey, this is where you're from, really, but I'm not, <laughs> right? And and and, uh, and 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 again, as I mentioned about the the the, the sort of. Um, my own sort of personal path as a young person without that confidence growing up and trying to find confidence artificially in things like gangs or whatever, you know, uh, where you from was the standard greeting that we had for each other when we didn't know somebody. Like we didn't even see civilians. We only saw other gang people. And when we, and when we, when we, um, would see someone else that was a young Asian American youth trying to act hard, act tough, you know, the first question you have is like, where are you from? And you're either an ally or you're not, you know? And so for me, like that point of, understanding was the departure point for me to think about warlord culture and think about the fact that like I was in Asian in Asian gangs fighting other Asian gangs. Like, we're all just looking for the same thing. We're looking to be seen in America. We're looking to be seen not as, you know, um, emasculated media figures from, you know, the eighties films and whatnot, you know, we're looking to be seen and, 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 um, and that sort of began the departure of the diaspora yes. drawings and whatnot. So that, for Asian American, oh sorry. Oh no, go ahead. You, you jumped off a little bit. You, no, no, you I got cut off you. a little bit. No, no, I'm, I'm. Oh, sorry. Yes. So, um, I was thinking about how the follow-up question to this question is the five-word question. No, where are you really from? Exactly. Which is a specifically uh, Asian American confrontation, like sort of a twist, because they never didn't want. They didn't want to know that you're from you know, San Bernardo, or <laughs> you didn't want to know that you were from San Diego. They wanted to know where your ancestors are from, but it doesn't get asked that way. No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. And again, because, and if you think about that question, if you think, first of all, thank you for framing it that way. If you think about that follow-up question, what that follow-up question does is entirely negates the value of the diaspora, right? Like, where are you from, Glenn? I'm from LA. No, 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 where are you from? Okay, your entire life means nothing. <laughs> right. Where, where does your ancestors from? You know, what, what is your ethnic heritage and the derivative? And so, so you're like, oh, that, that is a complication, you know, that to me for years was, was, uh, um, was an invisible space, you know? And I think that again, in conversation recently with a bunch of Asian American filmmakers, um, who, who, who are participating, you know, in this new Renaissance, um, moment of Asian American film, you know, I, I was at a meeting and one, one of them recently just said, he said the stories of us, like he, he was talking about himself, but I'm Asian American. He said the stories of Asian Americans are stories of the future, you know, because we are living out a visualization that has never been lived out before right now in this moment. And there are people in Asia who are considering the diaspora. There are people who have been here before, who've never seen this before. And they've, 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 they've imagined this moment. We've imagined golden globe winners, or maybe we even couldn't imagine, but we're here. You know? And so what does that look like? And what does that mean? And so I, I'm just excited to be part of that conversation. Well, I have one phrase that you left me with, and it's I, it's so resonant. And I, I know I should be able to break it down for myself, but I feel like I need some help. And that is diaspora as a time machine. That is such a beautiful um, verbal concept. Um, and I, I could you kind of could you unpack that a little bit for me? And yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. 
Yeah, no, I think that I think that um, you know when I when I what I mean when I say that is is sort of like you know when we like I I I come from the position intellectually that things are not fixed, right? Um, and so even even anthropological positions are are only fixed until the moment where like you know the scholarship and and, and observation happens. And if you think about like you know the notions of um, again trying to figure out like a location for the dialogue for, of the diaspora, you say, well, is it in the past? You know, and you go, no, because uh, the, the past is just a marking and it's a map, you know, but it's not a lived experience. And it doesn't really, yeah, it doesn't, you know, do that. And, 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 and you know, for me, you know, um, being able to, you know, like on your computer time machine, you know, you know, to be able to have a conversation across generations and create analysis with lived experience you know, th that, that is an ultimate time machine. You know, it, it is the opportunity for us to create and, 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 and recognize, um, you know, moments of emotional value, um, of, of, of cultural value, of learnings, because, not, you know, things are not always good, you know, and so it, and, but to be able to do that, you know, for everyone, not just for Asian Americans, but, you know, for everyone to think about the diaspora in that way, as opposed to think of histories as fixed, you know, um, allows us to then use the concept as a tool, you know, for empathetic growth going forward, you know, of which we will then add to that story, right, Th than it is to, to think about things as, as, as fixed, right? The responsibility of ingesting and reconfiguring fixed histories is so great. Like, why would we do that? You know, we it's, it's, it's a lot of pressure to put on everyone in the world. <laughs> so... <laughs> well, no, that was great. Thank you. I actually thought for some reason that a time machine only went backwards in time. And then you reminded me, of course, it goes yeah. to the future as well. Yeah, yeah. No, that's why that's why when I was talking to to to, to those folks, I, I was we, we were in dialogue and I said time machine, that's what time machine. And, and then he was like, these are the story. We, we are the future. And I was like, oh, man, yes, <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> so. Well, Glenn, I think we are about at the right time for some questions, because I, I know we've been sort of gathering them up Uh as the conversation went on. Now, I'm not sure if I should pass the baton to Chloe or to Eleanor or both, but I'm going to cut out right now. Okay, thank you so much, Dan. And thank you, Glenn, for that incredibly generous dialogue. Um, that was wonderful to listen to. We do have several really great questions. Eleanor is going to ask the first one on behalf of our friend GE. Eleanor, I'll give you the mic. Thank you so, so much, Glenn and Dan. This has been really, really wonderful. Um, I will ask our first audience question today on behalf of GE. GE wrote, in evoking the physicality and spirituality of the concept of the tiger, are you seeking to conjure the elements of strength, courage, and protection? Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, was, yes, without but elaborating on that, I would say, um uh taking into account like those symbolic meanings as as so strong um and then finding out that there were never any japanese tigers and actually the reason why ancient japanese scrolls um in representations of tigers like look look all look all fucked up is that they got hides for, through trade from China and Korea um, and were told that they look like cats and had domestic house cats so like they would paint artists would paint you know these compositions without ever seeing a tiger um, uh, you know the, the, the poetry of, of knowing what that symbolism means and having the entire thing be imagined you know I, I, I just really love the idea that there's this confidence that we have that is as real as it is you know and 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 for me um, it, it's like when I was working with magic um like the end result of a you know 11 14 year journey was like you're a magician because you're a magician <laughs> not because you know magic tricks you know and you're confident you're a tiger because you're a tiger not because you ever lived in a forest you know <laughs> so and, and so for me that's that sort of like where, where that all comes from so <laughs> thank you GE. thanks for that question ge um and thanks for that answer glenn uh the next question is going to be from barbara barbara i'll give you the chance to unmute Hi, it took me a minute to figure out how to unmute. Hi, Dan. Hi, Glenn. It's really great. Hi, this, this was just fantastic. I understand Glenn's work and appreciate it so much more after this conversation. 
I am really, really interested in the notion of diaspora artists as the future. You know, it's an issue I've thought of for a long time. And um, what I want to know is, um, well, you know, so often Asian American artists are described as bridging the East and the West, which to <laughs> me seems very binary and does not give you a secure identity as a tiger would have, for example. Um, but um, do you think diaspora opens the door to a new understanding of universal or do we just abandon the notion of universal? No, I think that's, first of all, it's a fantastic word that we haven't brought up that I should have brought up. And, and I, I'm, I'm really grateful for you to bring that up. Um, no, I think that the, the, the whole idea is that these are universal stories. Right. And I think that in the past, um, Asian stories, Asian American stories, Asian American stories of the Asian American diaspora have only uh, been given the value of the utility of bridging the East and the West. And so for those of us who have no real relationship to the to the East, it's like, well, then we have no value, <laughs> because if I can't actually bridge the East and West, then why am what I, am I here? What am I doing here? You know, and and but if you're if you're Stephen Yun. You know, and you're doing a story about, uh, uh, you know, road rage <laughs> in beef or, or Minari, a farmer, you know, like the, these are universal stories. Right. And and, and it, they just happen to be also because they're diaspora stories, other cultures uh, can relate to them in um, non exploitative ways in, in, in a way that like it's not just like what what Ming um uh, Tiampo describes as cultural mercantilism. It's not just the appropriating of like Orientalism, you know, to serve modernism, right? Like a story of like the, the, like the movie Minari or whatever. You know, these are just stories of uh, of a uh, of a diaspora that uh, are very relatable to to everyone and, and universal. And, I, and that's where the the writer uh, challenged me, and that's where I challenged myself, and I, and I was humbled, but also I felt grateful that that um, and 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 weirdly. Um, started to build because i can't even say i'm there yet but starting to build the confidence that our stories are universal um uh, and, and, and i think just um we have to believe that they are for them to be you know and i'll just diverge into a magic story real quick when i i did a 10-year exploration of, of magic or more and the first thing that a magician uh first trick i ever learned from a magician besides watching david blaine on youtube in slow motion uh, which is hilarious but uh my, my friend my old teacher had a coin and he vanished it like and it was this beautiful vanish, right? And he he handed me the coin and he said, "Learn to pick this up and hold it a thousand times tonight, and come back tomorrow, and I'll teach you how to vanish it." And I said, "I will do whatever you say because that sounds like wax on, wax off, and some karate kid shit. I'll do that, but like I'm always going to ask why." And he says, "Glenn, because when you vanish a coin in front of an audience, you have to believe that it's dissolving in thin air, because if you don't believe the most." no one is going to believe more than you. And I, I thought that that changed my entire practice also because I was like, you know what? Like we have to believe. And so I have to now believe and somehow muster the strength to believe that these stories are universal. Um, I do, you know, it's an exercise in belief. Uh, I sort of believe for a living. Um, but but um, yeah, but thank you. I right, love that thank question. You. Thank you for that question, Barbara. Um, the next question is going to be from Belle. Belle, I'll give you the chance to unmute. Hi, Dan, Glenn. Thank you so much. Um, I have to actually, I'm a high school art teacher and my class is about to start, um, but I would love to ask my question. I'm a huge fan. I brought my students out to see your um, exhibit at, at Mass Mocha. And we have a lot of conversations about um, what a monument and a memorial is these days. And one of sort of my, my observations and a conversation I like to have with them is about your piece being um, what a modern mo or postmodern or whatever we call it these days, what a monument might look like now, a monument to an idea, to, you know, um, uh, to this interconnected, these communities that feel the same uh, sort of wounds. And anyway, I'm going on, but I, I love your work and I just would love to sort of throw that question to you. And maybe I could bring some of your thoughts back to my students, but we, we talk about what that, what artists role in, building monuments is anymore if there is one and what that looks like and we use we often talk about your work as an example so I don't know if you can talk to yeah, me about what you For think sure. yeah no definitely look I think that like historically monuments 
again, back to time machines, it's really monuments were like time capsules, right? Monuments were were they're 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 they're, they're monumental. They're freaking hard to make. Right. Like they're, sometimes they're big, sometimes they're heavy. They take a lot of resources. And, and, and what happens is a community gets together to make a monument or, or, or a rich person. Either way, whoever is the arbiter of history of the moment figures out how to muster the resources to build something monumental, difficult to move, difficult to erase to assert an idea from that moment into the future, <laughs> right? Years from now, they're gonna remember this old dude. They're gonna remember that old idea, you know? And, and that's the history of sort of monument making, right? Um, and, and, and as we saw recently, <laughs> you know, um, we have now figured out the means to demonumentalize monuments, right? And so, so uh, because some ideas maybe are renegotiated into the future, right? Um, I, I'm actually, I, I take the approach now because I'm actually involved in a bunch of monuments that I'm, I'm making like five public sculptures around the country right now, <laughs> four of them in LA. So uh, really big things. And, and what I do is I, I do, dis I, I've been engaged distinctly with the community because what I, all, the only thing I know is, is the tracings of who was there when. And, and for me, all of my works are very site specific and engage long-term um Hi, class. Uh, long term, <laughs> yo. Uh, uh, long term, long term conversations with communities, knowing that the dialogue that we will have as a community with future inhabitants of this area, or is very geographic and and uh, political. Uh, and so that's sort of like what what all that comes down to. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bell. Um, and hello to your class. I hope. You have an inspiring day. Um, and our last question today is going to be from Larry. Larry, I'll give you the chance to unmute. Larry. I think <laughs> I know who this Larry is. Uh, Maybe. Hey, Glenn. Um, <laughs> your, your, your paintings sort of perhaps echo back to um, your one-hour paintings. Yes. Who uh, They were of grand masters, and they were people you knew of, but you did not know. And so I just thought that there is kind of that kind of reflection sort of uh, going back and going forward but um end of story <laughs> <laughs> um yes thank you i was I, I was thinking about you recently um yes i in fact like the the last body of painting i showed was uh, a series of paintings executed in an hour of chess masters utilizing a chess clock in between two canvases um, to make sure that they were all timed for an hour um, and they were a dialogue that the paintings were having with each other that were having with me but they were executed also in black and white, um, and and in fact are are a direct uh, connection to 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 this work, um, and and I think that uh, that slippage between the known and the unknown, um, in that case they were bound by the mechanics of time, you know, um, and and so I hesitate to call these works process based because they're not process paintings, uh, but again I think my approach having a different sort of you know uh, trained in technical skill but also applying like conceptual rigor to it, um, you know allows for all this stuff to happen. Um, and and uh, what I said earlier uh, that I had shown, um, you know, paintings at the project and 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 at the uh, St. Louis Museum, you know, this is that's exactly what I was talking about. So thank you for thank sure. you for bringing that up. Thank you, Larry, and thank you all of you for those incredibly thoughtful One questions. Sec. Thank you, Glenn, as well for all those amazing answers. Oh, um, no worries. And thank you again, of course, to Dan and to Glenn for today's conversation, which was extremely illuminating. Um, thank you to Sarah, to Emily, Talia, Kaylin, and Lauren at PACE for their support in preparing for today's program. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art, who sponsor this program and make daily conversations like this one possible. They also support our archive, which you can view on the Rails YouTube channel. The Rail has been free and independent for 23 years. A donation directly supports our writers, our production staff, and our operations. You can support our work through the link that we're about to post in the chat. And if you're free tomorrow at 1 p.m., join us for Grown Ass Women, a poetry reading rescheduled from last week and curated by Patty McCarthy. It'll feature readings by McCarthy, Marcella Durand, Tanya Foster, and Karen Weiser. And as is real tradition, you can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so, so much for joining us on this snowy Tuesday in New York. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much everyone. Glad. Bye. 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 Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Happy New Year. Are you in New York? Happy New Year. Getting back on Saturday morning. Oh, great. 
<laughs> Can't wait to see you, Glenn. I'm sorry I was in the meeting, but can't wait to see the show, Glenn. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank okay, you. thank you.